Okay, hello everybody. My name is Ori and I'm excited to be here to share a success story of my team. It all started when we decided to expose our service to new audiences, which presented new challenges that resulted in a lower adoption rate. We looked back in the past and we found out a method from the aviation industry almost 100 years old and adapted it to our service. Does your service or product depend on the, user in, on the user's cloud? If so, maybe you can take some key takeaways from this session. In the year 1935, a prototype Boeing B-17 crashed in Ohio, killing two pilots. After that, a group of engineers decided to come up with a new method called pre-flight checklist to ensure the flight safety. This is performed until today before each flight. Pre-flight checklists can include checking the fuel quantity, the baggage weight, the air crew documents, and more. Like airplanes, our service is also in the cloud, so we decided to adapt this method. I'm a developer in the OpenShift Cluster Manager team. OpenShift is a Kubernetes-based platform that enables developers to deploy their application. You can use our managed service in the link above to create clusters with a single API call, to uh, deploy more machines, to schedule upgrade, to get the latest version, get metrics about your cluster, uh, CPU usage and memory usage, and more. How does it work in a high level? The user is making a single API call to create a cluster. Our service is starting validating the cluster spec, running some business logic, and if everything goes fine, we are continuing to the installation phase, triggering the OpenShift installer, and if anything is wrong, we return an error to the user they can fix and retry again. After 40 minutes, if, if the installation is successful, you can deploy your application on the cluster, if it went wrong, we get an error and you have to investigate it and to retry and start all the process again. Up until here, everything worked fine. But then we decided to expose our product to new audiences, presenting the customer cloud subscription. So on the left hand side, you can see our previous offering where if you wanted to have a cluster, we had a pool of AWS account pre-configured and ready, we would allocate one of them, create a cluster, and provide to you access to the AWS cloud and you can manage your cluster. Now, customer cloud subscription has many advantages. First, this is costless, you have your own customized account, you can bring your own VPC, and more. But then all of a sudden, we are starting to see a lot of installation failures sometimes the account is not configured or missing quota. I want you to imagine a user trying to create a cluster and they, they are sitting, it is moving to the installation phase and they are sitting in front of the monitor waiting 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes just to find out that the cluster is in an error state. How frustrating is that? They have now to delete the cluster, delete resources in the cloud, call the support and start all over again. And there is no guarantee that on the next time it is going to be successful. Maybe something else will be wrong with the cloud account. So this is not a good user experience and probably not the way to attract new customers to our service. So what do we do? We go back to the pre-flight checklist and we are adding a new layer in our service. You can see the purple rectangle, the pre-flight layer, where we are making multiple API calls to the AWS cloud of the user, and we are verifying that the account is ready to create a cluster. Like, like an airplane needs fuel for a flight, a cluster needs resources, Elastic IP, EC2 instances, load balancer, like an air crew need documents and permission, our service need permissions to provision a cluster and manage it in the user account. So from here, we have two options. Option number one, if anything is wrong with the account, 
we return a bad request, the user can adjust the AWS account and start over all over again. We are preventing an installation failure. If everything is fine, we are moving to the installation phase with a much higher success rate. Let, just before that, I have to say, to be honest, there is a trade-off here. First, previously, we could return a, a response to the user in one second. But now we are making multiple API calls and it takes much longer. The user can wait up to 10 seconds. The second thing, this is not 100% bulletproof because we are checking the user account in a very specific uh, time, like a snapshot. So if the account was valid and ready to provision a cluster and after that we move to the installation phase and something changed, we don't have any protection against that. Let's see how does it look like from the user perspective. For that, we are going to use the UI, creating a cluster, choosing the AWS cloud. Here, we, in the wizard, we have the option to uh, configure uh, the cluster uh, spec. You can, one option is to choose next and get the default configuration for the cluster. So specifying the AWS account, then a set of roles to grant permissions in the AWS account. And here you have to, uh, the option to click next and get the default spec. So we're going uh, quickly through this. And then at the last step, we're going to make an API call to create uh, the cluster, choosing the cloud region, the version, uh, setting the machine pools and the network configuration and so on. In the last stage, we're going to see the cluster uh, spec, a summary, and then clicking create cluster, making API call. And now the preflag checks are running in the background. So here in this case, we can see you need a last one available Elastic IP address to create your cluster. We have just prevented an installation failure. The user can jump to the AWS console here in service quota. They can uh, make a, a request to increase the quota. This is one option. Uh, making uh, this request. The other option is to release redundant resources that they don't need. In this case, we are going to release one Elastic IP, and after that, they are going to have enough available quota to provision a cluster. Going back to the Red Hat console, creating a cluster. Now again, the preflights are going to run in the background. Once all of them pass, we can move to the installation phase. A closer look at that, uh, how, how do we get a quota? We have the applied quota in a specific region, in this case 10, we're calling get service quota to get the limit in a specific region. Then for the utilization, we're calling describe addresses with the EC2 service. Once we have the utilization and the limit, we can calculate the available quota and, and to ensure this is enough to provision a cluster. We have multiple preflights for quota, for authorization in the user account. We are also supporting bring your own VPC and validating the configuration for that. To summarize, we decided to expose our service to new customers. It introduced a new challenge. We combined an old aviation method with the, uh, with the cloud SDK. It increased the product adoption and the success rate. Uh, you can find our open source repo, Rosa. This is the CLI tool that we are using to provision cluster and you are welcome to contribute. Um, this is it. Thank you and a great time for questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, so it works from uh, console. Will it work if uh, customers provision uh, OpenShift cluster directly from marketplaces of cloud? Um, so, okay, um, the question was you asked if it works from the console and if it will work for, from marketplaces in the cloud. So specifically, when you saw the UI, our backend, we, the preflights are in the backend. So if it, this is from the UI or from our CLI tools, 
all of them are making API calls to the same backend. And when you create a cluster, trigger the cluster creation, we run the pre-flights. Mm -hmm. So pre-flights are actually uh, a part of uh, provisioning API. It's not a layer in the console which does the pre-flights. It's in the backend and it works for the CLI and for the UI. Okay, thanks a lot.